everyone. So quick, uh, I'm going to be using poll everywhere for uh, today's activity. Uh, I've got some questions that I put up there. Uh, here's the links to that information. I'll make the polls active here in just a second. So we can start going over the questions. Um, so there's multiple ways to do it. I'll make it a little bit larger. Just you can't zoom between 200, 100 and 200. So. You can actually go online if you're on the computer, polyb.com, Michael Barney, 114. You can send texts or you can scan that QR code if that's just easier for you. Those are all options. Uh, before we get started on today's activity, um, just a few reminders. Uh, if you have not already done so, please complete the beginning of semester questionnaire by the end of day today. Um, pretty much everybody in the class has done that. We just have a few outliers and I want to make sure that that all gets done. Please remember that is your substantive interaction uh, activity for this course, so you do need to complete it to prove that you're being involved in the course, which everybody who's enrolled in the course is pretty much sitting in this room, so you'd think that I'd be able to take that at face value, but no, no, they, they, they insist that I have an assignment. Uh, yeah, um, so next week, we're going to have our second lecture, Chapter 2, on Monday. We're going to have our uh, AI activity. The AI activity is going to be pretty open. Um, it's going to be... Uh, um, a lot of uh, doing stuff just off the top of my head. I've got some ideas about some things we're going to cover, but uh, uh, this is something that is becoming far more prominent. And so I thought it'd be fun to talk about uh, as a, an intermediate activity. Because it's AIS, you know, I have to actually include some fun stuff at the beginning so you just don't think it's all UML diagrams. So, uh, and then we will have our first homework assignment due on next Friday. The lead into that homework assignment, what we will be doing on pretty much every Friday, except for ones that are related to testing, is we're going to be doing Excel activities. Um, I know that you all already have some experience in Excel, some of you far more than others. Uh, there may be, like I said, several of you in this room who wouldn't like go through the Excel uh, activities we're doing. You're not learning anything new. That's a good thing if I'm not teaching anything new at the beginning, simply because that means you already have the knowledge that's requisite for uh or moving outside of the classroom. I will tell you part of the reason that we harp so much on this, why you spend so much time in Excel and why we do so many activities in business and accounting and economics is that our employers constantly demand strong Excel skill sets. And I will say personally, from my perspective, having good Excel skills gives you a big advantage over the people that you'll be working with. This happened to me. I graduated, I had I had what I thought were good Excel skills. It turns out I was missing, I had some pretty big gaps in my Excel skill set, but we'll talk about that in a, as the semester goes along. But uh, I was working with people who had no Excel capability and I was able to do things and uh, conform tasks that they weren't able to. Probably more importantly, uh, it's Excel is a gateway for other programs. Um, having good Excel skills means that you'll be able to adapt to new programs and new technologies much more easily. So I am a big fan of making sure that Excel skills are strong. I'm not going to tell you that by the time that this course is over that uh, that you're going to be an expert in Excel. I'm going to say that probably uh, by the time that you're graduate, you've graduated, you should have good, strong Excel skills. But uh, if there's something that you learn that's new in this course, then I'll be gratified because that'll be something that's helpful. I try to throw stuff in there that even though we're going to be reviewing stuff that's very remedial and basic, to put it in a framework that's a little bit interesting and say this is how you would practically use this. Situation. It's not going to be all just about like typing on a piece of paper and saying, here's how you do a sum function or here's how you do a count function. We will be doing those. We'll be reiterating those, but I'm going to put them in practical perspective. So that's the goal. With that, um, Excel does definitely have some features about it that are pretty, uh, pretty unique. So uh, uh, I told you guys, I think I told you all that uh, you should check out uh, the big four accountants and they actually have a, uh, an Excel, um, an Excel subreddit or sub, sub or whatever you want to call it associated with that. So I pulled some of these that I thought were pretty funny. And uh, so I thought, what better way to start out the day of talking about Excel than Excel memes, okay? And by the way, if you talk to Dr. Caden, she will tell you that I don't actually teach content. I teach through memes, all right? But if you're learning, I mean, that's an effective, it's a learn effective uh, teaching, uh, an effective pedagogical strategy is that if you're learning through memes, that's all that's important. So the first one, uh, if you want to get on Dr. Caden's good side, do a friends meme for her, okay? Because she's a big fan of friends. And this is actually one of those memes where uh, uh, Joey and Phoebe are trying to learn French together. And so they've used this as a context. And so, yeah, 12.5 uh, and set it out. And then you put this into Excel. And what does Excel? Does Excel say 12.5? No, it says 
uh, noon on uh, January 12th, 1900. Yeah, it, it's actually happened to me. So uh, we're going to talk about this as we move forward. Uh, but the date format, it's actually a numeric format in Excel. Um, and you're wondering, how does that work? All that the date conversion is, is that basically it starts at the year January 1st, 1900. And then every day added on to there is an additional day in the calendar. And then 0.5 is basically saying halfway through the day. So that's why it's noon. Um, so if you want to do a numeric conversion of today's date, it's something like 45,000 something, because that's the number of days it's been since January 1st, 1900, which leads to some interesting questions. Can Excel recognize dates before January 1st, 1900? The answer is no, it doesn't. I found this out last year when I was talking to Doug Villard, and he was uh, looking at some stuff I was working on, and I was like, so what happens if you put in a date before 1900? I was like, I've never tried it before. Yeah, so Excel apparently will not recognize something in uh, 18 to 1800s, which apparently to Excel, that was the beginning of human history is 1900. Yeah. All right, along with the uh, dates, uh, Optimus, the glass is half full, Gus's glass half date, Excel, the glass is January 2nd. <laughs> I don't know why that makes me laugh so much, but uh, yeah, that's, that's the way Excel works. All right, moving forward. Artificial intelligence is taking over. All right, here's, uh, here's Excel for you, okay? Type in January, February, and then it tries to autocomplete the rest of those pretty good. Now, obviously, you can point out, says, well, that's because February is spelled wrong, Dr. Barnes, but, you know, that's defeating the point of the joke, okay? It's defeating the point of the joke, all right? All right, uh, what gives people feelings of power? Money, yeah. Status, yes. Using shortcuts in Excel? Absolutely, absolutely. We're going to talk a lot about shortcuts. You're going to feel like you know so much more. I, I will tell you, it's so silly. It's, it's, it's a silly joke up here, but I will tell you, you will feel like you're an important person when you do something that's so simple to Excel, but you learn how to do it for the first time. And then other people say, that's really cool. How did you do that? It says, oh, it's so incredibly difficult. I can't even to explain it. Keep all of the secrets to yourself because that way you will seem like you're really, really smart. Okay. Some of the things that I'm going to teach you how to do, or you may already know how to do it. They're very easy, but if somebody doesn't work in Excel, they're going to be like, ah, that's cool. I can never do that. It says, yeah, you could. You just have to click a button like three times. Yeah, so, all right. Um, name something worse than a heartbreak. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's a good example. It's like, when you see that uh, pound dot ref uh, exclamation point, we see it all over the spreadsheet. That's just heartbreaking. So uh, if you don't know what that means, that basically means that your formula is broken somehow, that you've done something to disrupt the formula. This usually happens when you delete a cell in the formula. And uh, when uh, when I'm trying to modify a spreadsheet and all of a sudden all of my preferences go like this, I'm just kind of like, I go panic. That's when I start clicking undo really, really quickly. So yeah, just to make sure that, that I don't have that happen. Uh, <laughs> This one, uh, this one's uh, really, really nice. So the biggest Excel sin ever committed, look at the formula at the top row. Basically, somebody is trying to add all these formulas together by typing them out one at another. And you know somebody had to do this on purpose, but they just did this. This is like, this is, this is the combination of Excel sin and just a violation to somebody who has obsessive compulsive disorder like myself. Just looking at this, you know, it's, 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 it, it, this. This is cringeworthy. You notice I'm not looking at the screen right now because I can't handle it. Okay. Yeah. So that's one of the biggest sins ever committed for sure. And then uh, every company after using Excel after spending millions on enterprise resource planning system. So yeah, uh, they've got their jetliner and inside their luxury jetliner is the jetliner known as Excel. Okay. The jetliner known as Excel. It's actually, it's actually really funny because you think that, that we got so much technology, artificial intelligence taking over the world and, and, We've got these systems that are billions and billions of dollars going to run you know, trillions of operations in a second and, and all that. It's like Excel is still the backbone of business, the way it operates in the world. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the hidden infrastructure of every single system we'll see. You can't operate Excel. You basically can't function in business society nowadays. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's it. That's, those, that's my meme. So hopefully, hopefully you enjoyed that particular exhibit. It's all downhill from here. It's all downhill from here. And I mean it in the course, okay? It's all down. The course is all downhill. All right. Let's go ahead and let's do some questions. So, by the way, um, I would encourage you, as we're going through these uh, questions on the quiz, to answer your best, best of your capability and not wait until you start seeing people put answers on the screen and use what their answer is, okay? Um, obviously, that's something that's happened to the poll, poll everywhere. I tried to see if there was a display, and I'm sure there's a way I could nullify the display to get correct answers, but... Uh, I honestly don't know what it is. That's really, really bad. I, I don't claim to be technologically capable when it comes to poll everywhere. 
but it'll be nice to get results. And don't feel bad if you get some of these questions wrong. Uh, none of the questions, I would say, are really, really difficult, but some of them you may not have been exposed to before. We're going to talk about some of these uh, in detail about how they work. So first question that I'm going to throw to you, uh, let's go ahead and move to present. All right, a fast way to add up the column numbers is to click on the cell below the numbers and then do what? And I guess I should probably make it so we can see all the answers. My apologies, guys. Okay, there we go. We have a little bit of a uh, little bit of device missing here. So nobody clicked on subtotals, which is good. Okay, that's that's not good. Uh, View the sum in the formula bar. Um, that actually don't, doesn't put the sum in the formula bar. There's not actually that, that function. Then we have the option of clicking the sum button on the standard toolbar and auto sum. Auto, auto sum. And uh, sum is a formula, but it's not in the standard toolbar. The auto sum is in the standard toolbar. So C, uh, which is the vast majority of people, and I told you guys not to change your answers, and then somebody did. Somebody changed their answer, all right? <laughs> Yeah, there's that bias coming in. It's like, I don't want to be the wrong one. I'm not grading you on this, guys. I'm not grading you on this. It's not a big deal. All right. Uh, somebody changed their answer back. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, it's that peer pressure. Apparently, that instructor pressure works as well. All right. So let's take a look real quick. Uh, so um, I'm going to kind of zoom in. We're going to take a look at many of these and see how this works. And again, if you already know how to do this, that's fine. Um, again, I want to reiterate the point. Do not be disappointed if I do something that you already know how to do. That's, that is really, really important because I'm reinforcing things that you should already know. And a lot of these things are going to be fairly remedial. We actually have a very question, simple question about sums coming up. And uh, so uh, don't feel bad if, uh, or don't get disappointed about it. I promise you I will try to teach you things that you may not know how to do. But as far as this one goes, so let's just go ahead and say I'm going to type in one, two, and three. And then... I want to just basically sum those numbers together. So we can go into the formulas and you'll notice up here, it says auto sum. That's one of the formulas available. So I click on that and it automatically creates the sum formula for everything that's preceding it. And so the reason that it said you had to press enter is because it puts the formula in, but you actually have to make it, make it uh, act, activate the formula. So that's, that's the first one. So pretty straightforward. Uh, it actually doesn't get too much more difficult from there. Uh, most of these are pretty straightforward. Some of these may be a little bit more obscure. Let's go ahead and do the second one. If you want to paste a formula result, but not the underlying formula, to another cell, I'm going to move my face up here, uh, you would copy the cell with the formula, then place the insertion point in the cell you want to copy it to. What next? So this one is actually a really important one to know how to do, and so we'll talk about this. If you don't know how to do it, and if you do know how to do it, great. <coughs> this is one of those functions that uh, doesn't seem like it comes up very often, but I actually encounter it time and time again. So. All right, so it seems like the consensus is, is that we're going to be clicking paste and then values, all right? And that is correct, but I do want to talk about the options that you actually have for pasting because there's a lot of different, there are a lot of varieties, and uh, this is something that's evolved over time. I always feel like I'm, I'm kind of like the old man from the cartoons, like back in my day, you know, I talk about the way Excel used to be. Uh, pasting options have actually evolved quite a bit, and it's good. Um, so... The one we were talking about is how to paste uh, information from formulas. So I'm just going to say equals one plus two plus three. You notice I'd like to mix it up a little bit. Instead of putting one, two, three in cells, I'm now I'm doing a formula of one, two, and three. I'm a man of limited means. So that's going to be six. But uh, this was asking, how do we take this number and just put the uh, value in? So I can say, all right, I'm going to control C, and then I'm going to go to the paste, and I'm going to paste values right here. And of course, this actually just gives a number right here. Now, one of the nice things about this is this is variable to different operations. So um, if I wanted to uh, say, for example, say one, two, three, and I've got my auto sum that I'm going to create. And then I've got four, five, and six. There's a couple of different ways that I could just copy over the formula itself. All right. Now, some of you may be saying that it's dynamic, Dr. Bards, that uh, the, uh, we have uh, uh, floating cell references, which is really important because that way it actually copies the formula, but not the inputs to the formula, which is good. That's the case. 
But say, for example, I'm working on a completely different worksheet or a different part of the worksheet that I couldn't just copy that over. I could uh, obviously just copy, so copy this. By the way, oh, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, copy this, and then I could paste. I could go over here. Oops, I hit the escape button, which defeats the purpose. There we go. And I could paste the formulas themselves, which is just the opposite, instead of pasting the values in the formulas. Uh, by the way, we were talking about the power of shortcuts. So let's talk about the power of three shortcuts that you need to know and should get very, very comfortable with. There's a lot of them. There's there's too many to count, proverbially speaking. Uh, but uh, what are some what are some ones that you should know? For, so first of all, you should know how to copy. What's that one? Control C. Control C. Good. You should know how to cut. What's that one? Yes. Control X. And you should know how to paste, which is Control V. Yes. And the easier, the more that you get in the habit of using those when you're doing this, I just, I kind of don't even think about those anymore because I've been doing this. Those are ones that you will use very, very frequently. So those are ones that I strongly encourage that you use a shortcut for. There are some others that I, that I personally use more frequently than others. Like one of my, uh, one of my ones that I tend to use a lot and to my hazard is repeat. Does anybody know what the, re uh, the, the repeat uh, function of shortcut is? F4. Okay. So if you want to repeat some tasks that you've done something, you can hit F4. Why do I say to be very careful with that? It's because uh, when writing macros, if you uh, do F4 in a macro, it really messes up the macro. So, uh, but we're not going to go too much into detail on that. I will say that that's that's a shortcut key that I probably should not have learned, and yet I can't unlearn it now. So, uh, some shortcut keys are better than others. But Control C, Control V, Control X, those are all ones that I encourage you to utilize very liberally. All right, let's keep going. How do you change the column width to fit the contents? Looks like we've got double clicking the boundary is kind of the answer, and I think that we've got correct. And we're correct there. So let's just take a look. Okay. So we've got something that expands beyond the boundary. So we'll say AIS is super awesome because that's a statement that everybody will make in excel all right so just to make sure we get that and just double click that's the easy way it's a shortcut right there by the way if i wanted to format the entire uh the entire uh worksheet like i wanted to change the format of the entire worksheet so you know where i click Corner. Top corner, yes. Uh, I believe it's called the cornerstone, the keystone, whatever it's called. So I, I can highlight the entire worksheet and I can actually format the entire thing. There. So, yeah, good identification. All right. Uh, moving forward. There are three worksheets with every new workbook, which, by the way, you can tell this is an older version because that doesn't actually happen on our, on our computers. Of course, that may be setting. Can you, you can change the automatic number if you want to? Well, I kind of gave the answer away. And you change that automatic number. Do you have to be an administrator to change that automatic number? The answer is yes, you can. And how do we actually go through that? Well, let's just take a look. So we'll go File. We'll go to Options. And under General, it will tell you how to include any of these sheets when you're creating new workbooks. And we're currently defaulting in the computer lab at one. At least I, I'm at one. Is everybody else at one here? That everybody calls like everybody's looking at three worksheets says what is this old man talking about so no uh you can actually change this you can actually update this you want to open up three worksheets it will open up three worksheets at the beginning if you only want to open up one because you only need one that's the way the default to do that but this change right here as well as you can change the uh initial uh setup on the uh computers themselves its font size and things along those lines i don't know what's happened i don't know if this is an excel feature i noticed recently Excel files used to be opening up in Arial as their font, and uh, some in Calibri, and now we're starting to do Aptos and Arrow. And uh, I don't know, is that is that where everybody else is on their Excel, Excel spreadsheets that they look at? Is it default to Aptos and Arrow? I don't know why that is. I, I kind of like Aptos and Arrow, just not one that I ever used before. Maybe it's just maybe it's just to mix things up because you know one font gets boring. If I was still if I was still had my way, I'd still be operating in Comic Sans all the time. So. Uh, yeah. Actually, something you'll notice, I tend to I tend to use Palatino Linotype because I'm such a goofy person that using a formal font makes me feel like I'm professional. So that's that's one that you will see a lot. All right, moving forward. 
pound, 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 pound means what? So it looks like everybody answered the cell is not wide enough. And that is, in fact, the correct answer. So I was trying to mess with this earlier when I was preparing for this. It's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And technically, that's wide enough that it actually adjusts the width of the cell. So how do we actually check that? Well, you need to make the cell more narrow to see what happens. What happens. So usually, this doesn't happen when you're typing something in. Excel, especially modern Excel, will make adjustments to the information that you input. But Say, for example, you create a spreadsheet, and currently I'm zoomed in at 190%. Let's say I created this at like 80% and then zoomed in. That would actually change the parameters of the spreadsheet, and this is frequently where this comes up. So that's just a point of advice. Say, for example, that you are creating a spreadsheet that you're going to turn in for an assignment. Be very, very aware that if somebody else is going to have to zoom in to read the information, it may change the formatting. So you might want to check it and make sure that your cells are wide enough based on different levels of uh, different levels of moving in because let's see I'm going to try to make this you know, uh, there we go so if I zoom down eh, it's still going to stay the same size but like we could actually change that to where it's almost visible depending on the level that we zoom at anyway just an interesting piece of information there we go all right Question number six, to add a new row, click the cell in the row immediately above where you want to add the new row, where you want the new row. All right, I think the consensus here is that is a false statement and is in fact a false statement. So that would actually create a lot of problems. If you were trying to click the spreadsheet, anytime you clicked a cell above where you want a new row, it added a new row, that would create a lot of chaos. So uh, what are some ways that we can actually do this? Well, so first thing I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna show you how to do this. And you may say, Dr. Barnes, I do it differently. And that is fine, all right? Pretty much everything that I'm gonna show you how to do in Excel, there are multiple ways to do it. And I will show you one way to do it. And you can find many different ways to approach this. How do I do this if I wanna add a new row? Let's say that I've got uh, one and three, whoops, one and three, and I want to add a row where I can put in my two because I use one, two, three. So the easiest way that I found to do this is just to right click on the or row below where I want to add the new row and just click insert. Now, again, there's multiple ways to go about this. This is not the only way, oops. but that is definitely one way to go about this. By the way, does anybody know what the default number, or sorry, the maximum number of rows that you can have in one single worksheet is? It is one million. Does anybody know what happens when you put in one million rows into a worksheet? The world stops turning. So yeah, uh, I will say one of the reasons that you learn some technology tools other than Excel is that Excel is really good for small data sets. And when I say small, I mean usually about 10,000 rows or smaller. If you get above 10,000 rows, Excel starts really, really struggling. And so I've had some 100,000 row, row spreadsheets and even a few 1 million row spreadsheets where Excel just basically said, yeah, we can't handle this anymore. Now, obviously, this is con contingent on the, the number of columns. If it's just one cell with one, 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 one cell per row, it can probably handle a million okay. But most of the spreadsheets I'm talking about have data inputs across multiple columns, so like 20 columns of a million rows. Yeah, Excel will stop working, which is why we need other technology tools that can handle large amounts of data. So, but careful warning, Excel is not good for extremely large data sets. All right. Question number seven. Which key do you press to group two or more non-adjacent worksheets? Now we have some division here, some division, some chaos. We have a majority here, but we don't have everybody necessarily agreeing. So let's take a look. Okay, let's take a look. So I'm going to create some uh, additional tabs down here. And 
what if I want to group these? What if I want to put these all in a group so that I could actually change the formatting for all the spreadsheets at the same time or print out multiple worksheets simultaneously? Well, if they're adjacent to one another, if they're right next to each other, then shift will work because shift will actually capture the group. So if I hold down the shift key, you'll notice that I'm picking up all of these. But what if I want sheets one and four? Just one sheets one and four. If I hold down the shift key, it captures everything. All right. So it can't be the shift key. So if I want non-adjacent worksheets, then basically what I'm going to have to do is hold down the control key because that's how we select individual items. By the way, you might want to make a note of this because this does well come up occasionally. Uh, you notice that I mentioned uh, how to print when you're grouping. So, so when you usually when you print out one worksheet, you can format that one worksheet to actually fit the number of, amount of parameters you want. But say, for example, you want one worksheet to be on the front and you want your second worksheet to be on the back side of a piece of paper. How would you do that? This is kind of how you would set it up. You would set the printing parameters for each worksheet, and you would say, this one prints on the front, and then hold down control to say, this is my second worksheet, this is one prints on the back. So you can print multiple worksheets simultaneously, as well as format those simultaneously. This is what you would use this particular task for. All right. Moving forward. To copy an entire worksheet and all its data, you should click the worksheet tab of the sheet you want to copy, hold down shift, and then drag the selected sheet along the row of the sheet tabs. This, 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 this question sounds a little bit like the wording on CPA exam questions. So they actually came up with something that sounds good, but if you know how to do it, it's like, no, it's not even close to what I would do, okay? So uh, if, if you don't know what it's doing, you can look at this and say, that actually sounds like something I would do. And it, it sounds like a good explanation, but unfortunately, it's not what we would do to actually copy it. So what would be the easiest way to copy a copy worksheet? So I got my one, two, three. There's multiple ways, again, to go about it. What, is, what do I find the easiest way to do it? I'm just going to right-click, and I have the options to move or copy. So I can move. If I, if I leave it like this, I can move it to anywhere in the worksheet. I can also move this to a new workbook, including a blank workbook. I can create a new workbook. If I want to copy this, then I'm going to click on that Create a Copy button. That's what I, I believe is the easiest way to do it. And there we go. Next question. Which formula can all of, add all the numeric values and arrange the cells, ignoring those that are not numeric and place the result in a different cell? So the key to answer this question is looking at the beginning where it says add all the numeric values in a range of cells, which is going to be our sum function, okay? Now, count, we'll do the same thing. We'll actually look at the count within the uh, range of cells. It's important to note that count itself only captures numeric inputs. If you wanted to capture all inputs, whether or not they're numeric or not, you would need count A, okay? So that actually counts everything. But count is just basically saying, does this cell have in an input? Then I count that, that's one. Does this cell have an input? That's count two. We're actually going to have some exercises where we explore count and the different very variation, variations of count functions. Uh, they can be very, very beneficial, but this one is just our good old friendly sum function, which I'm not going to show you how to do in Excel because I'm assuming that was one of the very first things you learned how to do. All right, moving forward. Is it possible to insert an image from a file into an Excel spreadsheet? People believe yes, and that is correct. And there's actually a few ways you can go about it. Let's talk about what their solution is. This is, by the way, from a published online quiz, so I want to talk about the way that they said to do it. So the way that they uh, specify is if you go to Insert, you actually go over. This is illustration. If it seems like I'm, uh, I'm stopping and trying to figure out what's going on, this is actually a different layout than the computer upstairs in my office, so I was looking at there. There we go, pictures right there. And you can actually specify where you want to place it within the pictures. So 
again. My my upstairs computer was a little bit different, that's why it took me a second. There's actually a, another way you can go about this. This is actually one that I frequently use. You can just copy and paste an image right into the Excel spreadsheet. So let's say that I want to say I want to copy this. So I'm going to use my snipping tool. By the way, does everybody know what the snipping tool does? If you've never used snipping tool, by the way, you can find it down here and just type in snipping tool. And this is basically an easy way for you to do screen captures. And I do encourage you to learn how to do that because screen captures can be very valuable, particularly in the courses that I teach because I talk about them all the time. So we're going to do new. And we're just going to copy this part of this image. And I'm going to jump over here to my worksheet and control V it in there. There we go. Now, that's not the traditional way of copying a picture. What they're talking about is an actual image file. That's what you would use to capture, capture the picture. But if you just want to capture a screen capture, you can copy that directly into a spreadsheet. All right. Question number 11. Can an Excel spreadsheet be used as the data source for a word mail merge? The majority of people in the class say yes. Somebody described the sentence and say no. No. But the answer is yes. Actually, all the Office tools tend to integrate very well with one another. So the mail merge, let's just go and talk about this. You may use this at some point. We definitely will not be using that in this class. Oops. Uh, I want to take a look at it and just talk about what it's referring to. <coughs> this is actually in Microsoft Word, which I probably should have had open before because now I've got a vamp and wait for Microsoft Word to open. Is everybody excited to learn about Excel, learn about mail merge? Come on, hurry up. I don't have much to say. The Friday, my brain is gone. So <laughs> it may just never open. It's just going to throw, it's just going to stay here and continue opening. So mail merge is basically an application within Microsoft Word that allows you to create letters. And then you have one letter that you're going to mail out to multiple individuals, for example. Um, so you need to actually have a different address for each individual that you're going to send the mail for. And you can create envelopes, you can keep uh, labels. And this is going to drive me insane because it's never going to open, so I'm not going to bother with it. Uh, so where does that data come from? The answer is you could have this in an Excel table, and you just specify within this particular column, I want to pull the data from this, uh, this, uh, for this item. For this column, this is going to be address. For this column, this is name. This is date. This is zip code. Very, very nice function because even though it's a Microsoft Word platform, we can all agree that Excel is much better for holding tabular data such as that kind of information, which is why it works well in that situation. I really wish I could have shown you mail merge, but uh, yeah, my oversight, my apologies, guys. If you really, really want to see it, then we can stick around after class and I can just run you guys through it, okay? Be a little bit of non-extra credit training. So. All right, question number 12. On Excel sheets, the active sale is indicated by what? All right, large consensus of the class is a wide dark border, and that is correct, okay? Now, do we frequently see a dotted border? Okay, what does a dotted border apply? You're copying a cell. Yeah, you're copying a cell that says the cell that you're copying, all right? So that's what you see that. I have seen blinking borders before. I cannot remember off the top of my head where it remembers. It's so extreme that it comes up very, very infrequently, uh, but there is a, a routine red blinking border. By the way, I think they just wanted to have four answers, so they put none of, none of the above. Just as a teaching note for everybody in this class, uh, I don't ever use none of the above because I think uh, I think that's uh, not a very, very good tool. But I will occasionally use none or all of the above. If you see all of the above on any of my exams or any questions that I give you, be very, very careful. OK, usually what that means is, is that I have three of those answers and one of them is correct, but I couldn't come up with a good fourth answer. So I just kind of said, all right, forget it. I'm just going to do all of the above. I will tell you that there's several all of the above questions in the exams. There's maybe one or two where all of the above is the correct answer. Okay, so uh, it won't it won't be like your homework where all of the above is pretty much always the correct answer. Uh, and I, I say that now, giving away a lot of the homework assignments. So be very very careful when you say all of the above. I when I ask all of the above, it's mostly because I I can't think of something else to say. Yeah, which again is probably spoiling things, but I will tell you that there are at least one, probably more of questions on exams where all of the above is the correct answer, 
So be aware of that. All right, moving forward. Formula and function are the same things. This is a great question. So most everybody seems to agree false. Now, uh, does everybody believe that it's truly false or did somebody click on uh, false and then everybody just said, oh, okay, I'm gonna follow this person. No, I think you're right, it's, it's false, okay? Why is this the case, okay? Let's just think about this logically. So I've used a formula earlier. I said equals one plus two plus three. That's a formula, correct? Is that a function? No, what's an example of a function? Some sum is an example of function. So can we have formulas that contain functions? Absolutely. Is it required that a function has to contain a formula? Or sorry, formula has to be a function. No. Okay. We can have formulas without functions in them. That's the plus one plus two, one plus two plus three. So yes, usually a function will contain a formula, but a formula does not necessarily have to contain a function. So while they can be close to one another, they can be related, they're not the same thing. So interesting question there. Which symbol is used to multiply items by Excel? So we had a great question followed by a really, really easy question. So I'm not going to go too much in depth on this one. This one's a pretty straightforward question. This is the star symbol. All right. Which is really, really interesting because uh, that's, that's one of those problems that I have with the way that you all learn math uh, back in elementary school. So you learn the plus sign, all right, and that's add. You learn a minus sign, and that's subtract, and those are consistent through Excel. But then you uh, learn you learn math when you're in elementary school. What's the symbol in elementary school? It's an X, okay? Okay, by the way, if, I'm, if it seems like I'm asking you this, I'm still trying to verify. You know, when I was in elementary school, that was 40 years ago, okay? So things may have changed, but yeah. Uh, it's still, from what I remember, teaching my nieces, doing tutoring for my nieces is still X. And then the uh, when you divide, you've actually either got the division sign if you're doing simple division, or you've actually got the thing right there. Uh, yeah, this thing right here, like that. That's still pretty commonplace, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait for somebody. I'm gonna do this in, in, in a class and say, Dr. Barnes, that is so old school. You know, how, what year were you born? 1800? Says no, 1900. Get it right, okay? But uh, in Excel, we don't actually have those operations. We have the star and we have the slash symbol for dividing. And uh, I always thought that'd be confusing. I thought it just, why don't we just stay consistent? But the, the multiply makes sense because you, if you don't, if you use the X, what, is that the letter X or is that the, the uh, multiply symbol? Which also creates some problems when you get to algebra and you get to higher level functions when you use X as a variable. It says they have to italicize the X in the books to show this is not a multiplication sign, this is an actual variable here. Maybe we should just go back to in math class. Now I'm ranting. Now I'm ranting. Maybe in math classes we need to move over to the star and to the slash and uh, just take a word, take a, a tip from our Microsoft brethren who learned the uh, the wisdom in those these ways. Anyway, uh, as we all know, this is the uh, multiplication symbol right here. So we can use that moving forward. Last question. The formula. I'm not going to read the formula, but I'm going to say this formula is valid. Yes or no? By the way, this is a simplistic version of a type of question I would ask you on the exam, because you could easily answer this question by typing this in Excel and seeing if Excel would act, would, would know whether this formula is valid. But you will not have Excel on your exam, so you have to answer this by your knowledge. It looks like most everybody agrees that it's not a valid formula. What's missing in this formula? The parentheses at the end, the parentheses right at the end, because remember, anytime we open a parentheses, we have to close parentheses too. So if we close the parentheses right back here, it would be valid. Interestingly, if you type this into Excel, I think Excel would still recognize it. It would just try to automatically add the parentheses, but that's uh, because there's some autocorrect features as intelligence Excel becomes more intelligent. But at face value, if you just type this in, no, it should not be a valid formula. It would correct this, or it would give you an error saying you've got to add this parentheses to uh, make this correct. All right, good job. I'm very, very heartened by the, uh, the knowledge of the people who know Excel in this class. Like I said, um, as we move forward in this class, we're going to be learning some actual applications of situations where you can use Excel. Some of them will be easy, some of them will be a little bit more challenging. The goal here is not to frustrate you or to make you bored. The goal here is to make sure that once you walk out of Truman State University, 
that you can do the things that you need to be able to do for your job and your career. Um, keep in mind that as we're doing the Excel activities starting next week, again, these are not assignments. These are in-class activities, but you are still responsible for the knowledge on these activities for the exam. So I would encourage that you save your spreadsheets as we're working through these activities and take diligent notes on what we're doing. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. With that, does anybody can complain if I let you all 10 minutes early? By the way, if I ever ask that question, it's a legitimate question. My very first year here, I had a habit of, I was, I was in a Tuesday, Thursday class. This is story time. I promise it won't take a lot of time. Uh, I had a Tuesday, Thursday class, and I don't like teaching for more than 50 minutes at a time. 120, 120 minutes was just, or sorry, 90 minutes was rough. So uh, uh, I let up my class usually 10 to 15 minutes early pretty regularly. And somebody who had a grief with me, a real big beef with me, uh, basically said, he always let out class early. And uh, I'm paranoid about that now. All right, paranoid. So if I let you out of class and I say, if I, it's okay, if that's okay, so I'm legitimately asking. If anybody has a problem with it, raise your hand and we'll work it out. So, okay. Have a good weekend. Huh?